In this talk, I will review some practices that we use in my lab for prot scripting and for creating high quality speech manipulations and illustrations. In this audience, I expect there'll be a wide range of expertise. I'm aiming this talk at the people of the middle of that range, people who are actively writing scripts or modifying scripts that others have written. If you're writing your own plugins, then you're too advanced for this talk, and if you've just downloaded Prot this week, then you'll want to learn some more basics before fully appreciating this material. I will first share some basic good practices for using Prot, and then some helpful tools that we use that could make your work easier, and finally a rather deep dive into speech manipulation, where you can see some of these concepts in action. First, some good practices. When you read through your script, it's difficult to understand what the numbers mean without some explanations. This line isn't so easy to read because it's not clear what these numbers represent. The way this should be handled is to declare variables with meaningful names and assign those numbers. Then, when you see the function call, the whole line makes sense. This practice will make it much easier when you repeat the same function, and also easier when you just keep track of all your variables in one place. This one's particularly important because you don't want to use the same format analysis patterns for talkers who have different size vocal tracts. In longer scripts where I know that I'm setting lots and lots of parameters, I don't like to have them buried in random lines in the script. It's really annoying to have to search line by line to find, hey, there's where I set the pitch floor, and there's where I declared the folder location, and there's the duration and intensities way down at the bottom. I like to have them all in an easy to find place. My strategy is to just put them all in a single procedure that sets everything at once. Notice how when you call this procedure, it'll just bop down to the bottom and then back up to resume right where it left off. This can be used to convert your variables from the startup window, set defaults, and also store some settings that are important but which you don't want to burden the user with. Most importantly, they all go into one spot that's easy to find if you just scroll to the end. And even that section can have some helpful structure. When you zoom out and look at the script, these important variables stand out. And the goal is to make it easy for a human to read. And also easy for a human to understand how the script is constructed because we have all these explanations here in the text. And now we transition from good practices to actually helpful tools for you to use. There are many different tools out there, but I'll just show you a few just to get a taste of what's available. I encourage you to visit these websites to download the scripts that I'm showing up on the screen. First, check that the user is running your script on a recent version of Prot. This little bit of code tells them to update if they're not up to version 6. This kind of thing could be really useful, especially if you're using some newer features like arrays and functions with colon notation, as opposed to dot 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 notation. Here's a pair of procedures that convert frequency to the bark scale and then back. You can call the procedure using either of the two styles, the word call or the at symbol, and then notice how in the procedure there's a new thing called dot out. You can access that dot out after the function is run. But you can't assign it in one line, you have to do it in two lines. Now you can use that value to print out information or to use it as a variable. Or even better, you can encapsulate it in single quotes using a colon and a digit, which controls how many digits you print out. As a side note, when your code uses a formula or a method from some published paper, it's good to cite that paper, and also explain whether this was in fact the script that was used to make those experimental files. That'll make it a lot easier for yourself and others to replicate the work. Sometimes you want immediate confirmation that you've made the sound changes that you intended. For example, if I created a spectrum of different fricative sounds, I can run this script, select all those sounds, and it'll draw them out to make sure that they changed in the way that I was planning, like with the first peak gradually going down and the third peak going up. Or if I've created a continuum of format changes between hid and hood, I can run the script, select my continuum, and plot out to see that make sure that second format changed. You can learn more about how to use that script on our YouTube channel, and I'll point out that I personally use this just for exploration. Usually there are some features of the plot that I would like to change before inserting it into a talk or a published paper, and in that case I'd recommend exporting your numbers from Prot and then plotting them with a language with more powerful graphics capability, such as R. Again, there's a whole video on this that I encourage you to visit. Now this is a really useful tool to repeat the same action on every sound that you select. First, it asks you to select the sounds you want to do stuff to, and then it counts them and numbers them. It loops through each one of the sounds and identifies the name of each one. And then you choose exactly what you want to do with it. For example, you can have it obtain the intensity of each sound and then print it to the info window. And then after it's done, it'll reselect the sounds. 
This is useful for making sure it acted on all the ones you intended, and also if you need to repeat the same action with some minor change. For example, I can have it extract all the durations here. There they are. Or all the intensity values. There they are. Or something more complicated that I'll first do manually, selecting the sound, making a manipulation object. If I want all the words to be exactly 400 milliseconds, first I have to know how long it is to start. The total duration, 0.593. Okay, so then I can take this manipulation object, extract the duration tier, modify it to remove all the points between 0 and that final duration, and then just add one point which is going to be right at the beginning, and it's going to be 0.4, my desired duration, over the actual duration. Then I'll take it, replace it, reproduce the sound, and rename it 400. Okay. Now I can just paste that right into my window here, and with a little bit of magic, I've replaced boat with that generic name that it extracts, and I've encoded what my duration is, and I've told it exactly how to rename that output. So when I run it on all the sounds, now we have a whole bunch of sounds that are all exactly 400 milliseconds long. Speaking of warping durations, it's a good segue into anticipating some questionable choices that a user might make with your script. Here I have a segment of aspiration that's 67 milliseconds long, and I want to use it to create a VOT continuum that extends out to 75 milliseconds. It's not quite the duration I need, but there are ways to safely do that, as I'll get to later. But suppose you only have an original sound of 42 milliseconds and you want to extend it out to 120, that's actually a problem, because the warping of duration that will extend it will produce audible distortions. So in this script, I detect how much time warping the user is asking for, and stop the script if they're asking for something that I know will produce an inferior result. Sometimes the user's choice isn't so egregious, and you can change it for them along the way, but if you do this, I would recommend notifying them in some way, through a pause window or through printing on the info window. You can also look out for when your user makes selections that will be cut out of the sound. If they don't select zero crossings, then there'll be some click artifacts in the sound. So you can write in the script to jump to the nearest zero crossing to avoid that and cut it cleanly. Another little thing to watch out for is when you want to measure or alter the pitch contour. If you're trying to do that right at the beginning or ending of the sound, then you'll run into some trouble because there hasn't been enough time for the pitch window to fully form yet. So if you want the pitch right at the onset, you'll need to add some leading silence or trailing silence at the end. As a side note, the thing that you're measuring is fundamental frequency and not pitch, but whatever. Another thing to be cautious about is measuring formants in a vowel that's followed by a nasal sound. As you can see here, there are some extra resonances and anti-resonances for nasalized vowels that will disrupt the relationship between formants and tongue position. Very often you'll see people equate RMS amplitude for all their sounds. Presumably the goal is to equate loudness. But for short sounds, equating RMS does not actually do that. Consider these sounds have the same absolute intensity peak in the vowel, but the sound on the right has longer VOT. That means that for some stretch of time, there's a legitimate reason to have reduced intensity for the voiceless sound. RMS normalization does not mean equalizing loudness. First, loudness is not the same as intensity, particularly because the same intensity is perceived to have different loudness depending on the frequency, but also because some syllables just have lower intensities. For example, the words ball and pick have different intensities and shouldn't be equated. Ball is voiced throughout and has a low vowel, which tends to be louder. Pick not only has voiceless segments, but has a voiceless stop, which means there's a literal silent gap in the middle of the word. So it should have lower RMS intensity. The lesson here is that some syllables have lower intensities, and that's just natural. If you force them all to have the same intensity, you're actually introducing unnatural differences between those syllables. So now I move on to the last portion of the talk, which is to talk about higher level aspirational goals for manipulating speech. I'll walk through a phonetic cue that most of us are familiar with, voice onset time, or VOT. Suppose you have this sound da with this short little VOT here, and to turn this into a ta, there are a number of considerations to keep in mind. For example, we do not want to simply extend this aspiration backwards in time to tack it onto the front, because we have cues at the onset of the vowel that indicate voicing, 
particularly the first formant and also the fundamental frequency. So the spectrum says it's voiced and the VOT says it's voiceless and the listener might be confused because it's an unnatural stimulus. Instead, the voiceless aspiration actually cuts backwards into the vowel and that means that the configuration of the formants at the onset will actually transition over time. So now we see that depending on how far you cut back, you might be exciting that voiced formant transition at a different starting point. And even though these look like small, subtle differences, remember how the auditory system processes frequency logarithmically, so those small differences at the bottom of the chart are magnified and very perceptible. So now that we have that in mind, we can illustrate starting with a VOT of 10 milliseconds and then cutting progressively backwards to 20, 30, 40, and so on, until we reach 70 milliseconds. So in the end, we have our voiced and voiceless sounds with VOT of 10 and 70 milliseconds, which we can see in the waveform. But importantly, we can preserve the natural differences between the spectra as well, which could have meaningful consequences for perception. So this is just one taste of a larger goal of preserving naturalness in all speech manipulations, which we should all aspire to. A quick walk through what happens elsewhere in that script, starting with the original sound, we cut back into the vowel proportional to how long the VOT is, and then buffer it with silence so that we can make accurate pitch measurements at the onset. Manipulate the F0 over the first 75 milliseconds, based on acoustic studies, and then let it return back to its natural trajectory. After you're done manipulating the pitch, you no longer need that silent buffer. Then you shape the envelope or the intensity contour, because otherwise you'll risk having a rapid increase in loudness that would sound unnatural. Finally, we have two sounds that can be blended together and I recommend the concatenate with overlap function. And the reason you want to do this is, when you're combining two sounds in sequence, you want them to flow smoothly from one to the other, as opposed to having them sequenced discreetly. This whole sequence of processes is described in detail in this JASA paper from early 2020. One comment I want to point out here for those also writing scripts is that it's useful to upload a couple of demonstration sounds and have your script automatically select the landmarks and make decisions that the user would do. That way, it's like you can sit there with them, helping them along. Much more detail is described and narrated in video form on our Prot playlist on YouTube. The final sequence of thoughts I'll share is about manipulating formant contours. Now suppose we start with this ba sound, and what we do normally is estimate the LPC and inverse filter it, leaving us with a residual voice source that doesn't have any formant structure, and we can filter that residual voice source with some formant contours that we can manipulate by hand. The first one we take from the original ba, and then the final one we can take from, say, a da sound. Here are those contours right there. So we've created our endpoints, we've interpolated them, and now what we want to do is add those formants back to the residual source by filtering them again. So remember how the LPC required downsampling, and that means that the high frequency energy is missing above that Nyquist frequency. So what we want to do is take the original high frequency energy from the original sound we used, and as long as we resample that manipulated sound to make sure they have the same sampling rate, we can add those together to result in a stimulus that has full bandwidth. And it sounds very natural. An important assumption here is that those frequencies up high will not contribute anything phonetic, but just contribute naturalness. Now this is an assumption that might be false in some cases, but the idea here is that you want to exercise some discretion in where you're reinserting or restoring those high frequencies. For further details about this method and how we used it, check out our 2015 paper in JASA. And so now I'll wrap up this talk and I'll leave you with a few miscellaneous thoughts to encourage you to consider the role of the auditory system when you're creating your stimuli. It's commonly known that frequency is perceived logarithmically, so I suggest interpolating frequencies in that manner as well. As it turns out, just about everything is perceived nonlinearly including loudness. So if you have one sound at 100 and another sound at 300 milliseconds, the 300 millisecond sound will be louder, even if it's the same intensity, since loudness is integrated over time. Pitch, or fundamental frequency, is not just the first harmonic, even if that's the most straightforward measurement. The fundamental is expressed all over the spectrum, in the frequency and also in the time domains. Spectral changes are magnified, just as all changes are magnified by sensory systems. Perceived loudness depends on frequency, further complicating that issue. Finally, viewing perception as detecting and tracking amplitude modulations turns out to be a very useful approach and framework, so it's worth learning about.
With all these things in mind, I'm happy to be a resource to our community of people working on good practices for speech measurement and manipulation, and I look forward to learning from you as well. Thank you for listening.